Hey booze! In this video, I give commentary based on my opinion. Nothing is to be taken as factual. We are just here to have conversation. We don't expose and we don't sip tea on this channel. I'm giving you real talk straight, no chaser. Let's see if you can handle it. Cause I'm a boss. I didn't think for you to be proud of her. Of course you have. You are marrying a man who can support you. Hi ladies, it's Yanni and I'm back for part two. So we left off with the part where she was getting into her unfortunate miscarriage. Trigger warning to anyone who has experienced a miscarriage or any trauma related to infertility. I just wanted to give you a heads up and a warning that she is going to go into detail about this. And if you're not in a good place, I would not continue any further. I would maybe skip part two altogether and I will just see you in part three. Moving forward, I'm assuming that you are okay with the content that is going to follow and we're gonna go ahead and get right into part two. Okay, so this is part six of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? So where we left off. So obviously um, my doctor had called and told me there was no heartbeat. The pregnancy was not viable at that point. And I was cramping and spotting at work. Went into my best friend's office and immediately started crying. She was like, what's going on? And I said, um, I told her what the doctor said. And she grabbed her keys, grabbed her purse and was like, let's go. I'm taking you home. On my way home, I called my boyfriend and told him what the doctor said and he was like I'll meet you at home so he was coming from Duluth went straight home um and so about 24 48 hours later I had a doctor's appointment and my doctor gave me three options first option let everything happen naturally your body will expel the fetus on its own second option you can take a pill which will induce expelling the fetus at home. The pill basically will cause you to contract and expel. The third option was to go into the hospital and do a DNC. I did not want to do a DNC because I did not want to be in a hospital with COVID going on. Um, and for whatever reason, I did not do the option of let it happen naturally. So I chose to do the pill. His birthday was... Um, June 17th, my ex's boyfriend, excuse me, my ex's birthday was June 17th. So the decision was made. We're going to celebrate his birthday that day, go out to eat. Um, and then that night I would take the pill because we both were off from work the next two days, next two or three days. So um, went out to eat, to try to celebrate as best we could, and then took the pill that night. That night was the most traumatic, excruciating pain I've ever put my body through. Um, I do not recommend any woman, if prayerfully you don't have to go through that, but I don't recommend taking that pill. If you don't have to, don't do it. Um, I, st I spent the whole night in the bathroom just crying in so much pain. I couldn't take, they gave me a narcotic. I couldn't take it because it was, I found out I was allergic to it. So it was causing me to like projectile vomiting and it, it was a mess. So, um, and he was right there. You know, he was scared that he needed to take me to the ER. But in the morning, the pain kind of subsided. So about 72 hours later, I had another doctor's appointment where the purpose of this appointment was to do an ultrasound to see if everything had passed. Everything did not pass. So because of that, my doctor was like, we're going to have to do a DNC. Um, my DNC was scheduled for the first week of July. My boyfriend, my ex, was going to take me. Um, that was always the plan. Two days before my procedure, he tells me, he comes home and tells me 
that he is up for a promotion. He's up to he's up to be promoted to VP. Because of this, the president of the company, <coughs> excuse me, is coming in. And it was going to be this huge business meeting he had to go to. Um, the business meeting was scheduled for the day of my surgery. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing a fit because I was like, you, you know, you, you, there's no way you can do that meeting. Like I need you to take me to the hospital and all this other stuff. And so he offered to have his sister take me to the hospital. Um, apparently his sister lived in Douglasville. I was like, no, because I've never met her. Like, I'm not, I know, I'm not having a stranger take me to the hospital. No, this is a private situation. I don't want to do that, blah, blah, blah. So my aunt was going to, had offered to take me. And then my friend who took me home from work had offered to take me. So at that point, um, we get into an argument because he's like, my sister is you know, you, you about your family. So why can't she step in? And I was like, nah, because I don't know her period. I don't know her. So, so my friend offers to take me to the hospital. Cause I was all distressed that he's saying he has a business meeting and he can't take me. So I remember being on I-75 <laughs> on the connector on the phone with her crying because I, I was so embarrassed that he wasn't going to be the one to take me and that I was needing to rely on someone else to take me to the hospital in order to get a DNC done. And she was really great. She was like, girl, this is why you have a village. Like, it's okay. Things happen. The world is crazy right now. I will take you. You're going to be okay. So he did not take me to the hospital um, for my DNC. My friend did. She could not stay because of COVID protocol. Um, so when they wheeled me into pre-op after I got checked in, I texted him and was just letting him know, hey, here's the update. I'm about to, you know, I'm in pre-op. They're going to get me prepared to go back um, to the surgical ward or whatever. And the response I got was from his new executive assistant named David. Now, when he told me he was up for the promotion, he did tell me that part of getting this new job would be that he would get an executive uh, executive assistant named David. And he did tell me, I'm going to make sure that I inform David, if you get a text from this number, meaning from me, um, pull me out of the meeting because, you know, she's my fiance's having um, a procedure done and I'm picking her up. So it's important that you come get me if it's something serious. So I text him. David responds. He said, yeah, Mr. Blah Blah told me that um, you are having a procedure done. If you need me to get him, I can go get him. He's in a meeting. Just let me know what you need. And I just said, no, don't bother him. I'm just giving an update that they're about to take me back. And David responds and says, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. So I have the procedure. I wake up and I am now in recovery. I should be in recovery 45 minutes up to an hour and a half. I wake up. First thing I ask, and I remember asking, is where is so-and-so? The nurse who was so sweet, you know, she was like, everything went well. Um, you're doing great. She said, we spoke to your fiance. He's on his way. So I said, okay, you know, okay. I kind of dozed back out, but I could still hear everything that was going on. I just could not keep my eyes open to save my life. So I hear her talk to the other nurse. And that's when she said, yeah, um, Dr. So-and-so called her fiance and his executive assistant picked up. And the executive assistant said that he was in a business meeting and that, um, you know, you could relate to him what you need to say. And he'll, you know, tell Mr. He'll tell the fiance. And my doctor was like, hell no, <laughs> HIPAA. Um, I need to speak to him. So apparently my fiance called the doctor back about 30 minutes later 
And the doctor informed him she'll be ready to be discharged in about an hour. You know, you can make your way and come pick her up. He said he was on his way. He was on his way from Duluth to Atlanta, which is not a huge distance, but the time of day, one thing about Atlanta, there's always traffic. So he should have been there within the hour. I should have only been in recovery an hour and a half. Let's go to the next part. Part seven, who the fuck did I marry? So he should have, I should have been in recovery at Northside Hospital for about an, at most an hour and a half. Um, subsequently, I ended up being in recovery between three to three and a half hours. The nurses kept calling my ex asking, what's the status? Because they were actually getting ready to do a shift change. So they kept calling, asking, what's the status? What's the status? Like, where are you? I want to say that they called a total of three times and they spoke to him twice. Um, so at this point, I knew that they were all like, where is her? Where is her fiance? Like, what is going on? Um, he said he was stuck in traffic. And so he was making his way there. He eventually did get to Northside Hospital um, and they wheeled me down um, because, again, he couldn't come in um, just because of the protocols. So when I got in the car um, and I'm in pain, be it drugged up, couldn't keep my eyes open, couldn't really. I was just out of it. But I remember him calling my aunt and my mother and letting them know I picked her up. We're on the way home. Let me get her settled, and then um, I'll give you guys an update. I remember that. What I did not know was that he had texted my aunt and my mom and asked them to not bother me for like a week. Like, just please don't reach out to her. Let her just rest. I am from New Jersey. I am from an African-American family. You don't tell my black mama or my black aunt that, um, you know, please don't bother her for a week. <laughs> I didn't know this at the time, but I'm just interjecting that part. I'm trying to stay in the timeline, but um, he, he did apparently do that. And my aunt was like, why will fuck you up? Anyway, so go home. Um, he waits on me hand and foot. I recover, um, just needed about 24 to 48 hours to just get my mind right. Um, during this time, in between the when the house in Douglasville fell, um, fell through, we had not talked about a house. So I guess it was about a week later after the DNC, he decides that, you know, do you want to start looking for a house again? Excuse me, I have the hiccups, y'all. Do you want to start looking for a house again? Because of what happened with the house in Douglasville, I felt like I was smarter this time to say, you know, I want to be involved in every aspect because I don't know what the fuck happened with that house in Douglasville. But what I do know is that he, he lied to me. I didn't think, I, I didn't know then what I know now. I just knew he lied about putting in, or excuse me, I knew he lied about being under contract. So um, I told him, I said, I don't want to work with your friend who I've never met, never talked to. I know that he has talked to him because he's talked to him in front of me. And I'm going to demonstrate on one of the videos how he used to do his phone calls. Don't worry, it's coming. So we found a new real estate agent really nice guy. Um, his name was Scott. I am using his real name. Really nice guy. Um, and we told him what the budget was. And Scott was like, okay, when you guys are ready, we can start looking at houses. Try to look for houses that are empty because you can actually tour those. If it's a house where someone's already living in there, chances are it's going to, have to be a virtual tour because of COVID. So I found a house, um, that I absolutely, in total, we must have looked at about 15 houses. Um, 
but I found a house in Smyrna that I absolutely loved. We toured the house. Everything about this house was perfect. The house was listed for 699000 It was a brand new construction build. The only issue was that the basement was not finished. And he wanted the basement to be his man cave. Um, again, I went with him to tour this house. So this was already feeling very different than the situation in Douglasville. Because we did not actually tour the Douglasville house. We only did a FaceTime um, virtual tour. This house in Smyrna, we toured. We toured this house more than once. Um, and it was it was gorgeous. Fucking gorgeous. So we talked about it. He said that he had the money. Um, again, the price was $6.99. He said he felt comfortable putting in an all-cash offer. If you remember on the videos before, he told me he had money in his savings from when he played football. So when he said an all-cash offer, even I knew, you, you got that kind of money? Like, where you can cut a cashier's check for 699000 And he told me he did he had money in savings um, from when he played football, and he was very comfortable paying all cash for this home. So the real estate agent, Scott, sent over the paperwork. The paperwork was sent in both of our names. It was sent to my email. Um, that was another thing that I changed after Douglasville. Everything gets sent to me. And then I will be sure that he signs it. So he sent it to me. I looked over the offer. Um, we were asking, excuse me, we were going to put in an all cash full price offer with um, a request to have the basement finished. Also, we were requesting for the seller to give us an answer within 24 hours. Um, we were requesting a quick closing. Um, these are just some of the things I remember. I remember 24 hours, like I didn't want to wait on y'all think about it. 24 hours, let us know if you're accepting the offer or not. And then also a quick closing because it was a, a new construction. So we didn't have to wait for the current tenant to move out. We didn't have to do that. So I watched in our bedroom as he pulled it up because it was a electronic document. He signed his name to the offer for $699,000 cash. He requested again, the seller let us know in 24 hours if they were accepting the offer. So we submitted the offer at around 6 p.m. We were requesting that by 6 p.m. the next day, they let us know if the offer was accepted or not. I watched him sign the offer. I sent the offer back to Scott from my email. All parties had signed. Scott texted us and said, I got it. I'm submitting it. I will let you know what they say. Let's go into part seven. Sorry. Let's go into part eight. Good grief. This is getting long. Okay, so I just want to clear up some things that I realized um, is kind of creating some confusion. So just allow this video to serve as a stop sign. Let's clarify. First of all, the story, background. He was born in Philly, raised in Philly, and moved to Augusta. Um, story is that he moved to Augusta for high school. After high school, he went to college at San Diego State enjoyed San Diego State, stayed in San Diego for quite a while, um, got married in out in California, had a house in California, played arena football out in California, but his family was back here in Augusta, Georgia. Um, he still had a lot of family up in Philly, but for the most part, he had a sister in Augusta, he had a sister in Douglasville, he had a brother in Baltimore, he had another brother in Philly, and he had um, a brother in Nashville. So I just want to clarify that in terms of um, 
the demographic, not the demographics, but the geography. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to San Diego State for college, played football, stayed in San Diego, excuse me, stayed at San Diego, got married out there, but still had quite a bit of family here in Augusta, excuse me, here in Georgia. Um, he also had a sister, I think I said, who lived in Douglasville. <sighs> I have physically met his aunt who lived in Augusta. I've met his brother who lives in Augusta. Um, I have spoken on FaceTime with a brother who lives in Baltimore. Um, and then I will demonstrate how he used to talk to the brother that lives in Philly. That's coming up. You haven't missed that. In terms of the proposal, you did not miss the story of the proposal. I simply did want to share it because it was embarrassing. Basically, he gave me three ring options. We went to a jeweler at the Mall of Georgia. He had me pick out three rings. I told him which one I liked the most because I knew it wasn't a, a romantic proposal at all. I knew which ring I liked the most. I told him which one. He, he basically said, when I'm ready, I'll give you the ring and I'll propose. Fast forward um, about, I guess it was summer because I was actually pregnant when the ring came. We were sitting at the dinner table. He took the ring box out of his pocket, slammed it on the dinner table. And I was like, what is this? He was like, open it. I opened it. Inside was the ring that I had wanted, um, that I had chosen at the jeweler. And he was like, all right, so this means that you're going to be my wife. I was pregnant. So, again, when I asked y'all to give me grace, it's because there are certain things that's just like, girl, what was you thinking? Trust me. There's no excuse. Um, so there was never a, will you marry me? It was more of a, we're living together. We're having a baby together. Um, we need to get married because the backstory also was that his dad was a retired police officer, but at one point his father was a pastor. So he could quote the Bible like nobody's business, as we all know, so can Lucifer. But anyway, he could quote the Bible like no one's business. Um, and so that's how we ended up engaged. And I was wearing a ring. I was wearing, I will find a picture and I will try to post it. But I was wearing the ring. Um, don't worry, there's more to that story as well. So. Just wanted to clarify some things um, for the people who were like, wasn't it weird that he had a sister who um, lived close, but he's from Philly. So I just wanted to definitely bring clarity to what he told me um, was the backstory. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to California for foot, um, college, played football at San Diego State, played football in arena football. Um, worked at Apple, and then joined the condiment company in California, who then transferred him back to Georgia. He was married in California, um, and he told me he got divorced in California. That is important as well. That will come up again later. Um, and so the ex-wife, at this point in time, at the time that I'm telling you part seven, which is the last video I just posted, the ex-wife lived in California with her two kids, his two uh, stepkids. The two stepkids were 17 and 20 or 21, but they were that age group, that age group. And he was saying that he was very close with them. So he wanted to keep a tight relationship with them. Um, and he talked to them, if not every day, every other day. When I say, and I, I, when I say this, I need y'all to understand. When I say that he talked to someone, it means that he, he was on the phone in front of me talking to the person. I hope that that, because I will touch back on this. He was on the phone in front of me 
talking to the person. So he talked to his siblings every day. He talked to his aunt almost every day. He talked to his family the way I talked to my family almost every day. Um, and again, I will demonstrate how he used to do the phone calls. I will also demonstrate how he used to do the work phone calls because he called me every single day from work. And he would talk to people while he was on the phone with me. And I could hear people in the background, but that's a whole nother part. So again, buckle your seats. I promise I'm reading your comments, I'm reading your questions, but I wanted to bring this video just to clarify some stuff. Hopefully this helps. And um, honestly, I hope, I know people are fascinated by this, but more than anything, I hope that there's a woman watching this and she's saying to herself, okay, it's time for me to ask some questions. That's my hope. All right, part eight of who the fuck did I marry? So we submitted an offer on the house in Smyrna. I sent it over to Scott, our realtor. And next day comes, Scott asks if we can take a phone call. So he calls us and tells us that the offer was not accepted and the builder did not do a counter offer. We don't exactly know um, why. Um, we don't exactly know why he didn't accept it. But the bottom line is that we figured out later on that he didn't want to finish the basement. So the offer was not accepted. The house fell through. I was okay with that because, again. I knew he had put in an offer. So we continued looking at other houses. We found another house um, in Smyrna that he really liked. Um, I thought that it was way too big for just the two of us. Um, and so the price of this home was much higher than the 750000 that Chase had approved for the mortgage. So what he explained to me was that he was willing to do the $750,000 mortgage and he was also willing to put a significant amount of the money in savings on the house, which meant that he was now comfortable going from $750,000 up to about $900,000. Again, his his whole explanation was, I have the money where I can put down a substantial down payment, bring down the price of the home, and then basically mortgage the rest of it. So that was now the plan. I was not comfortable with a home <laughs> over $900,000. Um, but again, keep in mind, I saw the Chase paperwork. So I was like, I just feel more comfortable sticking at the 750000 mark. That's what you were approved for. Let's go with that. By this point, this is now fall of 2020. Um, we have been talking about marriage. I had my ring. Um, he had made VP at the company. And again, he was calling me every day from work. Um, the, I need to kind of explain how the company was ran because when you think VP, you would think he would be in an office. It was a condiment company, so they actually were producing the condiments, and I'm not saying the name of the company on purpose, but they were producing the condiments um, in this particular plant location. So a lot of times, he would simply tell me that he walked the floor um, checking in with his subordinates, basically. Now, how did he go to work? For the most part, at this point, he left before I woke up. However, pretty much he wore dress pants, um, kind of like a, deep, a dark navy blue cargo pant. And he had a polo shirt with the company logo on it. What I saw a lot of times is that he would not wear the polo shirt to work. He would wear like a company t-shirt. He would wear rubber sole shoes and the um, navy blue 
cargo pants. I didn't think it was a uniform, but it definitely, it reminded me of what someone would wear when I worked at Amazon, if you're going to be doing manual labor. He didn't go to work sloppy looking at all, but it definitely was not suit and tie. Nowhere near suit and tie. Um, it is fair to note that outside of work, he was a man who he loved to dress. He loved to wear the latest Jordans. He loved to collect watches. He collected a lot of Invicta watches. Um, he he loved to collect hats. He wore hats, baseball caps everywhere because he didn't like the shape of his head. Um, so in terms of how he dressed casually, the man, he could dress. Um, in terms of how he dressed for work, yeah, he didn't dress like a VP. But his excuse was, I'm constantly walking the production floor and I can't be in a suit and tie walking the production floor where they're creating the condiments that we're selling. So by this point, again, this is fall. We're still looking at houses. Um, we're still touring houses as much as we can because it is COVID. Um, we had found another house that we really liked and a house that I really, truly wanted to put an offer in on. This was now going to be the second house that we put an offer on. He put in the the asking price, I believe, was about 700000 He put in under asking um, an offer for about 650000 I'm guessing, but I'll try to find the house and put it on this and put it on the story. Um, the reason that that house fell through. <sighs> We found out that the home was sitting on a septic tank. We found out that the septic tank had an issue and it would have taken about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to fix the septic tank. The sellers were not willing to fix the septic tank. Personally, I didn't really care for the house that much. I'm the one who was like, I don't really want it. So even though we put an offer in, we had 24 hours where we could uh, pull our offer back. And so we did. Once we found out, I believe it was in the disclosure. And if you're a realtor, please feel free to tell me if I'm using the wrong terminology. But I believe it was in the disclosure that they told us the septic tank needs to be replaced. That's when I was like, nah, I don't I don't want that house. Um, so we pulled out. The house fell through. And so I was fine with it. Because again, I was heavily involved. I saw him sign the offer. I knew every step of what was going on. Our real estate agent, Scott, was amazing. But you will see in, when I get to it where he made a mistake as a real estate agent. So house number two fell through. Um, we then moved on, saw a few more houses. And then we get to house number three. I'm going to pause talking about the houses because now I need to introduce what happened with the cars. Stay tuned. All right. Part nine of who the fuck did I marry? So we're pausing on the house stuff. Let me tell you about the car. So when I met my ex-husband, I was driving a 2012 Nissan Rogue, um, fully loaded, it had quite a few miles on it, but it, it got me from A to B. It was in a, it was in good condition, but I was upside down in the car. He was driving a 2018 Ford Taurus, um, super, uh, sport mode. I know he had a sport mode on the car, and I love driving that car. Um, when he told me how he was a regional manager, he told me that one of the perks that came with the job was that he would be getting a company car, and so. We spent time going to Range Rover of South Atlanta. Um, we spent time going to Jaguar. We spent time going to BMW. We spent time going to uh, Ford, which was on Mount Zion in Morrow, if you all are familiar with that area. He test drove a whole lot of cars. In the end, he decided on a BMW sedan. I was there when he test drove the car i got in the car with him i loved it um and he explained to the salesperson you know i'm getting a company car i need to get a printout of the full price of the car 
tax tag and title because what my company is going to do is wire over the money for the car the salesperson was like okay you know apparently apparently that happens a lot so he gave him a printout with the tax tag and title for the car um in front of me and the salesperson he called the person in the finance department for his job obviously i have no idea what this person's name is but he called the person he explained to them this is the amount of money he said the president of the company so and so has authorized for him to get a car not spending more than i think ninety thousand tax tag and title the bmw came out to just under ninety thousand um and so he i remember this conversation so fucking vividly so he's he's on the phone in front i'm standing i'm sitting down the salesperson sitting down at their desk and he's like they you know they put me on hold and so he's like he i guess the person comes back and he says um yeah the, the price of the car is blah 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 he was like give me a second and i can send you a picture of that printout that shows tax tag and title for the bmw he gets off the phone he takes a picture of it he sends it to whoever he waits about 10 minutes he calls the person back he says did you get it apparently the person did get it but the person who can who can actually physically do the wire transfer had gone home for the day so what he says to um the bmw salesperson he's like okay we're gonna have to do this tomorrow because so and so went home for the day i don't know who the salesperson is i can only tell you from my viewpoint what i thought i had no reason to think this was a lie i really didn't because again you got to keep please keep in mind the circumstances that all of this is happening we're inside the dealership we're sitting at the desk of this person he gave us the printout he's on the phone do, you know doing business basically saying look i need this is how much money the car is going to cost he's taking a picture of it he seemingly is texting someone saying this is how much you know this is proof of how much it is then he asked the bmw salesperson i need your wire transfer information the guy got up rushed over to i guess their finance area to get the wire the bank wire information because obviously you have to wire it a certain kind of way rushes back over gives it to my ex-husband my ex-husband's like okay first thing in the morning we will get this wired over and then you know i'll come and pick up the car my fiance me will drive me up here to pick up the car so we leave he felt like because at the time that this all happened i was pregnant so he felt like look we're about to have a baby i don't want you driving that nissan rogue i want to get you something up i want to get you something more secure something new i really wanted a kia <laughs> I really wanted a Kia Telluride. Um, and he was like, well, let's let's look at the warranty. This man knew a lot about cars. He knew a lot about the warranty. He knew a lot about the depreciation value. And so he did talk to me a lot about what will we get the most for our money. Um, we test drove, when I say we, I, I test drove a Kia Telluride, a Kia Sorento. He didn't like either of those. He had me test drive a Ford Explorer. He didn't really care for that. Then came time where he really wanted me to get a BMW. Um, he really wanted me to get a BMW X5. So he took me to B Global BMW Imports which if you know anything about atlanta it's off of cobb parkway but you can see it off of set uh off the highway i believe 285 is where you can see the global imports bmw dealership he took me there he had me test drive an x5 and x6 um he also had me test drive a uh, i think i'm gonna get the numbers wrong a 525 which was a sedan i did not like that i wanted an suv 
Um, I loved driving the BMW. He also had me drive an M series, test drive an M series. So he was very adamant that I should get a BMW. The reason being is because according to him, he had a BMW in California when he lived in San Diego. He had a BMW that he loved. It was a white BMW. He showed me pictures of the BMW. So he showed me pictures of this white BMW that he had. And unfortunately, the car got totaled about two months before he moved to Georgia. So he had received um, money, not a lot, but uh, some money to get another car. And he used it to get the Ford Taurus because he was like, I just need a car that's going to get me from A to B until I get into a house and I'm much more settled. For him, he was like, I'm really giving myself 60 days to get settled here in Georgia after moving from California. But then he met me. Again, that's the story. So he had me test drive the BMW. So much so, I loved the BMW. Loved it. I wanted a dark blue BMW with cognac interior. I wanted an X5 and I wanted an M series. So I can clearly tell y'all that's exactly the car I wanted. We were online looking for that particular car because not every dealership had it. I was okay with a black BMW if needed, um, but I really wanted dark blue and I really wanted that cognac colored interior. So he felt like I want you to still, I want you to consider all of a sudden an Audi Q8. Let's just see how you like it. If you don't really like it, then we will go back to the BMW. I cannot tell you why he switched up. I can't. Um, but I can tell you he took me to an Audi dealership on Peachtree Industrial. He test drove an Audi and I test drove an Audi Q8. Um, I loved the Q8. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I was tired of test driving cars. By this point, I had test driven test driven so many cars um our weekends were spent either looking at a house or test driving cars and i was picky i will admit that so he had me test drive the q8 i really liked it i finally just told him look i'm good with either the bmw or the audi because i'm tired of, i'm tired of test driving cars he told my family he was buying me a new car because it, keep in mind he had well, not keep in mind, let me let y'all know. He had met my family initially on Zoom because again, we were locked down. He had met my family. Um, he also had met my family in person because at this point it was like, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, maybe we can do family dinner. Um, and so we had, so he had met my family in person. And now we will go ahead and move towards part 10 of this series okay part 10 who the fuck did i marry okay had to sneeze all right so at this point i had test driven all these cars kia's um hell he even had me test drive a nissan murano but the main two were bmw and an audi he had told my grandfather he was getting me a car he had told my aunt he was getting me a car that he was going to, he, he was like, she's going to be my wife. I want her to be in something secure. So my family was really like, wow, you know, uh, wow. You know, who knew that he had this kind of money? Um, and so I hated the fact that he did that because anytime he got around my family, here's another red flag to put in, in the United Nations of red flags. He would always talk about money and he would always brag. I never realized it in real time. I didn't realize it until I was out of the situation. He always bragged about the fact that he could fight, the fact that he had money, and the fact that he played football. Those are the three things he always bragged about. Back to the cars. So I told him, I was like, pick one between the BMW and the Audi, because you said you're buying it. So pick one. So this man chose the Audi. So he takes me to the dealership. I wanted a white Q8. He does the, give me the printout of how much it's gonna cost tax tag and title to get this Q8. 
gentleman who's helping us gives him the, the printout. He's saying he's going to pay this money for the car out of the savings account that's that's offshore. That's the story. That's what he's saying. So he apparently is asking the guy, you know, is there a holding fee? Can I pay a holding fee to secure this car while I'm working to get the money transferred? Because obviously with COVID, it's going to take long for the banks to transfer the money. Side note, I need everyone to understand one of the reasons why he was able to get away with the stuff he got away with is because we were on lockdown. It's crazy because it's now 2024, but I don't know. Do we all remember how it seemed like a lot of stuff stopped in 2020? Now, keep in mind, that's not an excuse I'm making because shit still got done. But in terms of business as usual, business as usual just was not happening in 2020 at this time so when he's saying oh it's going to take a while for the bank to transfer the money the gentleman who was working at audi did not even he didn't make a face he didn't he he didn't blink he was like i know it's going to take a while because of covid so basically what ends up happening is we leave he has the printout he calls the bank or he calls his his um financial advisor who does have a name the financial advisor's name is eric i feel comfortable using certain people's names especially if we find out they didn't exist um so he calls eric he tells eric in front of me in front of me hey i need to transfer seventy two thousand five hundred and twenty six dollars whatever the amount was because i'm buying a car for my fiance this is the bank account information do you need me to give it to you over the phone or do you need me to email it to you pause i can't hear what the person's saying but that's what he would do do you need me to give it to you over the phone or can i email it to you okay okay all right, give me a few minutes and I'll go ahead and email it to you. All right, let me know. I'll call you back to let to find out if you received it. Okay, hang up. So I'm hearing this because again, I'm not paying attention to, did I hear anybody on the other phone? Did I hear anybody on the other end? So he, um, he proceeds to type up an email, type up something telling him this is the information that we need um i didn't think anything of it he called me at work the next day to tell me that the money was sent to audi that he called audi and he confirmed with audi that they received the money what he told me is that the car is going to be um delivered to the house y'all we it's not that i lived in a hood because i didn't but I did not live in an area of Clayton County where you would have a brand new Audi delivered to your house. So I remember saying to him, I don't want that car like delivered to the house, not yet, because I need to put that car in the garage. And my Nissan was, I only had a one car garage, so my Nissan was in the garage. So he said, okay, well, let me call them back and change the delivery date. Can you be home? or can you do a half day so he's asking me can you work a half day so that they can deliver the car and you and you will be home for it i said yes that's fine because again it's COVID. i'm working from home anyway um i only had to go in the office two days a week so i i'm at home the next day he told me the car would be delivered between the hours of one and three Hmm. Obviously, between one and three, nothing happened. So three o'clock, I called him. He's at work. He sends me the voicemail. He calls me back. I said, it's three o'clock. I didn't know one ever came with the car. Um, What's going on? And then I remember I was like, well, do I need to call Audi myself? Because I thought that you handled it. But if you didn't handle it, let me, do I need to call them? And so whenever I would suggest I will handle it, he would get very, very defensive. Red flag number 472. So he was like, no, I will call Audi. Don't do anything. I'll call Audi and find out what's going on. Okay. 
So I'm at home chilling, cooking dinner, normal night. He calls me back and says, yeah, the car was stuck on the truck in Spartanburg because apparently that's where their deliveries come from. So when he told me this, I was in the kitchen laughing because by this point, I will be honest. And I told y'all I'll be honest even when it makes me look bad. I was guilty of, on one hand, I believed him. And on the other hand, I was like, let me see what lie he come up with. Let me just see. Um, but keep in mind, my brain was really like not rationalizing, not comprehending how deep the lie was. I just thought that no one told him the car was going to be delivered and he made that up. I had no idea how deep the lie went. So he said, you know, the car's in Spartanburg. Um, it should be delivered this weekend. The weekend came, he had a whole other excuse. Um, I don't remember what the exact excuse was as to why the car was never delivered. I do remember we got into an argument and I was like, don't even worry about it. I'm gonna get a new car my damn self. I don't even need your help. Which is probably one of the worst things you can tell a narcissist because they love to be the hero, you know, they lo it's, it's all about them. But I was like, don't even worry about it. I'll get when I when I have the money to get a car myself, I'll do it. I don't want to hear anything else about a new car. I don't want to hear shit else about a car. Because at this point, I was spending way too much time trying to figure out are we getting a car? Are we getting a house? Like where what the fuck is going on? Always there was an excuse. So when I told him, I don't want to hear anything else about a car and I am not going to a dealership to test drive another car, um, that ended that whole discussion right there. So this is what I'm, this is where I'm going to interject what I believe was happening. I believe that my ex-husband is the type of person he gets off, uh, you know, nut. He gets off on you being excited about something that he knows you will never get. So I believe that he enjoyed going to car dealerships. He enjoyed um, watching me test drive a car and get excited about it, knowing I was not going to get it. It is the it is the level of cruelty. And again, I'm telling y'all stuff, stuff that I found out way later on. It is the level of cruelty that I still cannot comprehend. So the whole issue about the BMW and the Audi, I think he just enjoyed seeing me get excited and then pull it away. Part 11 coming up. All right, part 11. So for this part, I'm just going to give you some backstory on the family. Pause all the stuff about the house. Pause the stuff about the car. This is backstory on his family, my ex-husband's family. All right, follow me. My ex-husband's parents, mom and dad, are both deceased. Mom passed away from cancer. Um, dad passed away shortly after her. I'm not sure what he passed away from. So he has a number of siblings. He has two, with his parents, he has um, two siblings, two brothers, excuse me, two brothers. One is older, lives in Philly. One is younger by two years lives in Nashville. He has two sisters. One, Shantae, is older, lives in Douglasville with her husband and two kids, a boy and a girl. Younger sister, Kim, is the baby, lives in Augusta with her husband, worked at, I think he told me, Procter & Gamble. That was the story. He had two half-brothers that were through his dad. One brother lived in Baltimore, the other brother lived in Augusta. The brother that lived in Augusta, I have physically met in person, shook hands, hugged, all that. The brother that lived in Baltimore, I have FaceTimed with, talked to him. The brother that lived in Philly, the older brother that he looked up to, I have never talked to him on the phone. I would always talk to him um, through my through my ex-husband so the conversation would be like hey babe uh 
brother brother so and so said, "Hey, he didn't call him brother so and so. We'll call him John." John said, "Hey, hey, John. I would be in the bathroom doing my hair, brushing my teeth. Hey, John." And he'd be like, "Did you hear?" He said, "How you doing?" I was like, "I'm good. How's he doing?" Um, because that's just me. And so he would relay back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, he talked to John every day from starting around July after the grandmother passed away. He would talk to John every morning. We both would be getting ready for work and he would be on the phone with John. They would be talking for 30, 40 minutes, talking about football, talking about other siblings. They would be talking about cars. They talk, I mean, it was it was really like not a big deal. They would talk about the brother in Baltimore. They would talk about the brother in Augusta. And then they would they would reminisce. This is the conversations I could hear. Let me explain. When I say I can hear a conversation, what that means is I am physically standing near him or next to him where I could hear him with the phone up to his ear talking to someone because it wasn't me. Okay. I may not hear the other person because the phone call may not be on speakerphone. But what I hear is, um, for example, I hear... Hey, man, what y'all doing? Oh, for real? Y'all barbecuing this weekend? What y'all making? Oh, that's what's up. Nah, I think me and her going to stay in this weekend because, you know, these numbers is looking crazy with COVID. Yeah, she over here. She's just sitting right here. She watched the TV. Okay, hold on. John said, hey. Hey, John. You heard her? Okay. All right, bro. I just wanted to check in on you. That's the type of conversation I'm explaining. Okay, so I hope that that gives a little more clarity about the type of conversations I'm hearing. So, um, I don't know why this light keeps going out. Um, okay, so that's the that's how he would talk to his siblings. The grandmother passed away. He called me around April or May <clears throat> and told me that his grandmother passed away. His grandmother um, on his dad's side had died suddenly from COVID. She had symptoms. She went to bed and did not wake up. He was distraught. He was crying. He wasn't eating. He was just sitting there um, listening to music, not watching TV, just sad because he was like, you know, my grandmother was always my, my support system. So from what I saw, it really bothered him. I did not think anything of it. I'm one of those people. If you tell me somebody in your in your family passed away, I'm going to believe you because I don't play about death. And I guess I expect other people don't either. Um, however, however, that is not the same for everyone else. But we'll get there. So family, he talked to his, he had his uh, sister, Shantae, who lived in Douglasville. Um, like I said, she was married with two kids. Apparently she was a nurse. So when I had my miscarriage, that was a sister that he was like, my sister will take you to the hospital. Like that's what family does. Okay. Um, I had never met Shantae. I've been on the phone or excuse me. I've been around him when he was on the phone with Shantae. Never heard her part of the conversation, um, but he would be talking to his sister. That's what he said. That's what it sounded like, too. Um, now, what is interesting is that we lived maybe 35, 40 minutes away from Douglasville. So there were plenty of times that he had invited me to go with him to his sister's house. Okay, let me tell you how this would always work out. Total times he invited me was probably three times for different barbecues or whatnot. The first time he invited me, I was like, no, nah, I ain't going because again, COVID. And she's a nurse. Hell no. Um, the second time he was like, yeah, she invited us, but I don't think we should go because COVID. No. The third time we ag I agreed to go. I was like, absolutely, I'll go meet your sister. Like, that'd be great. Um, on our way 
to her house to Douglasville to go see the sister. Um, apparently he got a phone call. The phone was always like on vibrate, but he got a phone call and he told me that something came up. And so she's, she had to cancel the barbecue to get together, whatever. Um, and so I was just like, oh man, you know, okay, well, hopefully we can go another time. It was, it didn't happen close enough for me to have red flags, if that makes sense. Um, but at this point, as y'all probably are like, girl, you so blind. But again, I didn't think anything of it because it's like, okay, it, it fell through. We'll see. We'll reschedule. Um, and so we just went out to eat. And then he talked to another brother, the brother from Augusta that he would have on speakerphone. So it was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. I really didn't. Um, man. And the more I talk about it, the more I realize, like, I'm, I'm not a dumb person. But it just never dawned on me the things that you have to now investigate. Um, it just, it didn't dawn on me. But nevertheless, that is the backstory for his family, right? Grandmother passed away. Three weeks later, he called me and told me his uncle had passed away from COVID. The uncle had tested positive, had to go into the hospital, and he died. It was um, a bit of a red flag. It was a bit of a red flag. But like I said, I don't play about death. So... I was just like, wow, because of these two deaths, he became a stickler about COVID. And when I mean a stickler, wear your mask, wear gloves, hand sanitize, wash your hands. Like he was annoying about making sure neither one of us caught COVID. So now I'm going to give you the backstory in regards to what I was told with the ex-wife. Okay. I know I look rough, but it's okay. It's okay. Anyway, so this is part 12 of who the fuck did I marry? So this is the backstory on what I was told for the ex-wife. This is important. Pay attention. <laughs> All right. This is 2020. So this is what I was told in 2020. I was told that he and his ex-wife used to be friends. Then they started dating and subsequently got married. They got married in California. Um, he had bought a house with the money that he made from arena football. They had apparently had gotten married on the downward of the arena football career. Um, had a nice house. He showed me a picture of the house, showed me pictures inside the house. Remember that? Showed me pictures inside the house. It was a really nice home in San Diego. And um, basically what happened was that he came home from work early one day and the hiccup, sorry, came home early from work one day and his wife was sleeping with another man. The man was in the house. He and the man get into it. Her son, who um, is about 17 years old in 2020, um, she had two kids, a daughter and a son. The son apparently was on his way home from school when my ex-husband found his previous wife in bed with another man. So the story goes that he and the guy fought. He kicked the guy out. He kicked his ex-wife out, but told her the kids could stay. The kids are not biologically his. Those are his stepkids. Um, she was like, you must be kidding. Like, I'm not leaving my kids here. The kids are old enough to where um, they were like, we're, we don't want to go because you fucked up. We don't want to leave. So apparently she leaves. Um, the kids stay with him for a few weeks. And uh, then she gets her own place. The kids move out, move in with their mom. He, um, he files for a divorce in California. He files for divorce in California, and it was an ugly divorce. She was asking for spousal support, all kinds of stuff. And then it turned into, um, you know, 
I'll help you with the kids, not child support, but just I'll, I will give you some money for the kids because apparently he was very close to the kids and he wanted to keep a relationship with the kids. Their biological fathers, apparently there were two fathers, their biological fathers were not in the picture. So um, the divorce starts out contested and ugly, eventually becomes amicable. Eventually they become cordial with each other. So my ex-husband moved. This is all all before he ever met me. So I'm telling you the story of what I was told in 2020. So eventually, about two years later, is when his job approached him about an opportunity to transfer to Georgia. And so he took it. New beginning, fresh start. He has family in Georgia. He took it. He told me this story pretty much the second or third conversation we had. Um, So it was always from the beginning that she had cheated. He caught her and um, he had filed for divorce, but he was still close to the kids. They still had a great relationship. I've heard him. I've heard him on the phone with the kids, you know, just encouraging them helping them, helping the 17 year old, like with homework. Um, the kids really apparently wanted to meet me and I was fine with that. Um, he would, apparently he would send them money, you know, if they needed something because he, he loved the kids as if they were his own. I'm telling you the story as I was told it in 2020. So, see around April or May of 2020, he informs me that his ex-wife has moved to Georgia. Apparently she's staying with her sister in Gwinnett County. So she has moved to Georgia. The two kids are now in Georgia. And so when he tells me all this, I'm like, so what was that supposed to mean? Now I will say this. He never made it seem as if she wants him back. He never presented that. It was always, no, nah, you know, we're we're cool for the kids. We're cool for the kids. Um, but he he's never presented that she was trying to get him back. I feel like it's fair to her for me to say that. Um, and again, stay with me. It all comes out. But um, that was the backstory in regards to the ex-wife, that they got married in California, they divorced in California, and then she eventually moved to Georgia, to Gwinnett County, after he had transferred to Georgia for his job. Um, He did tell me that, you know, every now and then he'll get a text message from her. Um, He told me that he, you know, told her when I was pregnant. He felt like she needed to hear that from him instead of hearing it from the kids. Um, And we got into a bit of an argument about that. But, honey, in the big scheme of things, that... (sighs) Anyway, so we got into an argument about that. I felt like the fuck, that's none of her business. Um, But that's the the overall backstory of her. So remember, (laughs) because there will be a quiz. But just remember, he... Um, met her in California, married her in California, divorced her in California. She moved to Georgia to Gwinnett County after he moved to Georgia. Are we clear? Okay. Okay. Part 13 of who the fuck did I marry? Um, so I've kind of given you guys all the backstory. Let's just kind of recap real quick. So I told you how we met met in March of 2020. Um, Basically, Georgia got shut down. I keep saying shut down, got locked down. We decided to quarantine together. I know it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, I really liked him (laughs) and thought he liked me. So um, I told you guys how we met. Um, Things moved at a rapid, rapid pace. Met in March. Moved in together pretty much beginning of end of March, beginning of April. Found out I was pregnant in May. Lost the baby in June. 
had to have surgery in July, started looking for houses, um, started looking at cars. All this stuff happened literally between March and the end of, excuse me, in August is when I got my car. So, um, got a car in August. He paid the down payment for that car. Um, which I was shocked by. And no, it was not a BMW or an Audi. It was a Nissan Altima, but I loved that car at the time. So he paid the down payment for that car. He told me he would help me with the car payment. The biggest mistake that I made, and I'll explain why I say this. The biggest mistake I made was that I signed myself up for a car, a car note, where I knew I needed his help to pay the car note. I knew better. My mom has always taught me, do not ever put yourself in a position where you are financially dependent on a man. And all of that went out the window. And the reason why I say that was the biggest mistake is because when I have pulled back the layers of this whole monstrosity of life <laughs> that I lived for 2020 and 2021, it really does boil down to the fact that I truly ended up marrying him more out of fear than anything else. And I'll expound upon that later. But um, I got the car in August. And by this point, I was, I was exhausted of looking at cars. I was mad that I didn't get a BMW X5 dark blue with cognac interior. Um... And I was tired of looking at houses, getting my hopes up, looking at a house and picturing myself in the master bedroom, the kitchen, the island, you know, all that stuff. I'm a visual person and I was tired of giving my, getting my hopes up. Um, so now we're going to segue into fall going into the holidays. <sighs> Here's what happened. In October, we looked at another house. This house was in Marietta. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, it was gorgeous. I want to say that the house was about $700,000. I really liked the house. I could see myself living there. I could see myself cooking there. Um, and so subsequently... My ex-husband put in an all-cash offer on that house. I watched him put an all-cash offer in on the house. Our real estate agent, Scott, called us about 24 hours later. And he said, um, the sellers love your offer. The offer was an all-cash, full asking price offer. 700000 let that sink in for a moment. He said the sellers love the offer. They are asking that you do that you show proof of funds so that they can accept the offer. My ex-husband said, I will show proof of funds when they accept the offer. The seller said, Great, we'll accept the offer when you show proof of funds. So basically we got into a stand, a standoff. Um, and if you're a real estate agent or you work in real, in, um, real estate, I would love to know your thoughts on this. I had asked people in my personal life, like, have you ever heard of this before? And I've had plenty of people who said I side with the ex-husband. I would not show my bank statements until they, um, accepted the offer. And then I had other people who were like, I wouldn't accept an all cash offer unless I verified that the person can pay. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Okay. So our real estate agent called us and was like, guys, you know, the sellers are giving you two days to show proof of funds. I had the letter that he showed me from Chase. I sent that to Scott, but that was for a mortgage. The offer was for all cash. So he needed to show all that he needs to show proof of funds that he had the cash to pay seven hundred thousand dollars. <sighs> he didn't show it. He refused to budge. 
on showing them um, proof of funds until they accepted the offer because he was afraid that they were going to create a bidding war. So what ended up happening was Scott called us and said, you know, I apologize because I didn't do my due diligence as a realtor. He said, before I ever started showing you guys a house, I should have um, collected your pre-approval letter and proof of funds. He said, so at this point, my broker has informed me that I cannot show you guys another house until you show at least us, meaning the um, real estate firm, until you show us proof of funds. And so I'm just like, well, I'm telling my ex-husband, just show them the fucking proof of funds. Like, what's the problem? Um, And so it was a lot of, you know, I don't really, I find that this is really unprofessional because it's not our fault that you didn't do your job correctly. It, It got a little ugly and it got uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't understand why you don't show them proof of funds when you clearly just signed a document stating that you're putting an offer in at full asking price. This was the same thing that the realtor was saying. He was like, but you just signed an offer. So what's the problem? Like you want them to accept the offer and then you'll show everyone the proof of funds. And my ex-husband without missing a beat said, yes. So Scott did his best to work with the seller and say, look, accept the offer. He'll show you, he'll open the books. He'll show you the proof of funds. These sellers were like, no, that's not. And it wasn't so much the sellers. It was the seller's agent. Big respect to the seller's agent. Um, But the seller's agent was like, no, that's not how we're doing business. He needs to show those proof of funds before before I advise my clients to accept his offer period. If he's not willing to do it, we'll go on to the next offer because they did have another offer on the table for, um, it was less than asking price, but, um, they were willing to accept that offer over the all cash offer because those people had basically shown proof. So subsequently the house fell through. We passed the two day deadline. They went with the other offer. Also, at this point, our real estate agent, Scott, and I do not blame him for this, pretty much cut all ties because what he, I believe, felt like was, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on and this is not how I do business. So until you guys are ready to show the proof of funds um, needed to buy a house, you need to get yourself another agent. Because we were already about 20 to 25 houses deep by this point. We had already put in two other offers. They fell through. And now here we are with this house. And once again, it fell through. Okay, so um, good news and bad news. Number one, this is part 14 of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? Bad news this is going to be the last post for the night. And the reason why, good news, um, tomorrow's my birthday. So I'm just going to make this video, post it, and then I will pick back up probably Friday because honestly, I truly want um, to enjoy my birthday tomorrow. I just, I just want to enjoy my birthday. Um, all right. So y'all don't be upset. <laughs> just if anything watch parts one through 14 and then um we'll be ready for part 15 so the house fell through in october 2020 and what i told him was i said i don't want to look at another house i don't want to talk about cars i want to get through the holidays Um, because it was going to be a holiday season where I could not celebrate my family because of COVID. So I said, I just want to get through the holidays. I want to get through the end of the year. Um, and we'll revisit stuff in January. I was very calm when I said it, no argument, nothing like that. Um, and he said he understood. I just... A lot of what fueled me staying in this situation 
really was the fact that number one, I didn't want to be alone. Number two, I didn't want to look stupid um, by having the relationship end so quickly for everyone to be like, we told you something was up. Um, And number three, I was ready to get married. And that what ready to get married fueled a lot of stuff. Um, And again, I was still making my audio diaries. So listening back to it, I knew something was, was wrong. I admit that I knew something was wrong, but what I thought it was truthfully was like, why does it seem like there's always something like, why can't we just go ahead and get the house? Um, why is it always something? Why can't I just get the BMW? It still didn't dawn on me how deep this something went. And for the people who keep asking, um, I'm going in order of events. So yes, there will be a video where I explain how everything came out and what came out, what was true, what was not true. It's coming. I'm just getting all of this out in order. So I told him I didn't want to look at a house no more. Um, I didn't want to talk about houses. Do not mention the word Zillow. Do not mention the word the word uh, realtor. Nothing. Let me just get through the holidays. And for myself, the question was, what do you want to do? You want to stay with him? Or do you want to cut your losses? And the part that kept me constantly second guessing myself was, what if he's not lying? What if he's not lying? There's no, literally the conversation I had with myself was, there's no way he is lying about having money. You saw, you saw the paper from Chase. They don't just approve $750,000 for a mortgage for anybody. Um, You see, I've seen his checking account. You see how much money is in his available checking. Like you, you, I don't think he's lying. (laughs) I don't think he's lying about that. But what is it? Is it that he doesn't trust me? Like I second guess myself so much. Is it that he doesn't trust me? Is it that maybe he doesn't really want to get married? Like what is it? Because I know what I saw. I know what I heard. I know that he's having conversations about move the money from this account to that account. Um, I know he's paying my car note and all these bills. Like clearly this man is making money. I know that I saw the the promotion the letter from HR that states his new salary is two hundred and something thousand. Um and I remember thinking like, God, what, like, what am I missing? I'm missing something, but what is it? Because I know what I've seen. I've no, I know what I have touched. I have physically touched these, these papers. Like I know how to read. So what is it that I am missing? He's close to his family. He talks to them all the time. You know, he's just a regular guy that just likes to watch um, NFL football. He leaves me alone when I want to watch Georgia football. Um, you know, he's paying all. He's paying the bills, groceries. I haven't had to worry financially since I've met him. And as a woman who had lived on her own, paying her own bills, my God, that is the most intoxicating feeling when you meet a guy who just takes your stress and your worry away financially. But the downside is he took away the stress and the worry financially away and instead brought a mental fuck job I've never in my life had experienced and I could not put my finger on it. I couldn't really talk to anybody about it because I'm a big believer in what happens at home stays at home. So I didn't talk to my girlfriends about it. I didn't talk to my family about it, but I'm, I, I just remember being like, what am I missing? What am I missing? Um, 
So we did not talk about houses. We did not look at cars. We didn't do any of that for November, December. And he came to me like around Thanksgiving and he, what I thought was a very open, loving conversation. And in that conversation, he was like, okay, I know I have fucked up. I know that things are not feeling too strong right now. He was like, I want us to get married. I want I, I want a home. Um, I will show you whatever you need to see to put you at ease. Um, he was very um, like contrite. He was very just like what what do what do I need to do to put your mind at ease so that you know I'm in this and that I want this and that I love you and I want you to be my wife. Um, so I was like, show me your accounts. He showed me his checking. He showed me, he showed me one of his savings. He showed me a chase savings. Um, he did not show me the offshore and he did not show me the U S bank. So he showed me those two accounts, checking and chase savings. So I knew that there was money. What I saw in those accounts, there was money. I told him, I was like, if we're going to buy a house, I want it to be through the mortgage on Chase. I don't want to deal with this proof of fund shit no more. I said, I do not want to look at another house until the beginning of the ne- of the new year. He said, okay. That is when we then had a conversation. So I guess I lied because we are going to have a part uh, 15 or 16 tonight. Um, but... That is when we then had the discussion about marriage. And that is where religion came into play. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I'll give y'all the other part tonight. Stand by. Girl, and it does not stop. It does not stop. The crazy does not stop. By this time, girl, I was fully invested and I was watching this in real time. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, she is going to give us one more part tonight. And I stayed up to watch this next part, which will be in part three on my platform. So stay tuned. I'm going to upload that tomorrow. But today I at least gave you two hours worth to watch. And then we're going to get into part three tomorrow, which will be Saturday so I hope to see you in part three so yeah comment down below your thoughts and opinions so far on this story and I hope to see you like I said again in part three